Man, it is uh, an incredible honor and privilege to be here at High Point St. Vincent this morning in a church body in this congregation where I would be happy, quite frankly, just to sit and to receive the word of God from unbelievably equipped and trained pastors and preachers that you've got in your midst. Can we just give it up for your pastor, Pastor Al? That was good. That was pretty good. That was pretty good. Pretty good. But I know who the real applause goes to. Can we give it up for Miss Debbie? Please, come on. Come on. Grateful for you guys. Grateful for your friendship and your ministry. Pastor Blake, so grateful for you and your influence as well. It's true. Um, I loved how Pastor Al said it. We are family. We are High Point family. And I'm really grateful for that. Um, I don't know if you know this or not, but actually today at High Point Chicago, um, they are celebrating... 23 faithful years of ministry. So here's what we're going to do. Don't, don't clap yet because it's, 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 it's going to be good. Um, can we have some fun this morning before we get started in the Word real quick? Is that okay? Because I know, well, listen, I, I, know, I know you're ready to have fun, okay? Uh, listen, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to record a video, and I'm going to be like, hey, you know, we're just, uh, happy 23, because we're two hours ahead. They're all, they're all waking up right now. I'm gonna be like, da, 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 da. And then I'm going to go, oh, uh, real quick, I've got one message for you from St. Vincent. And I'm going to turn around, and we're going to stand up and go, happy anniversary! We're going to go crazy. We're going to like let it loose for a second. Okay, is, that, is everyone thumbs up if you're with me? In the, sorry, in the States, this means amen. So you, are, are you with me on that? Are you with, okay, 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 okay. Okay, hang on. Uh, okay, just one second. I gotta get to the. Here, 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 here. Okay, uh, video. This is gonna, oh, this is gonna be so good. He's gonna. Okay, here we go. Uh, switch the. Here we go. Okay. Yee. Okay, got it. Okay. Uh, a little close. Okay. 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 Pastors, uh, man, I know you guys are waking up, getting ready to be able to preach the word, um, to be able to minister to God's people on God's day. What an amazing Sunday it is for us to be able to celebrate 23 years of faithful ministry coming out of High Point. Um, oh, that reminds me. I, I've got a quick message for you from the good people at St. Vincent. Ready? Happy, Happy anniversary! Yay! Yeah! Okay. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's really good. Now, now you, you, know, you know that as part of the High Point family, here's what we're focused on. We are focused on glorifying a limitless God by living out a limitless faith so we can be used by him to reach the limitless people that need to hear about him and his salvation. Amen? Amen. That's what we're about at High Point. Now, we're not just about that at um, High Point in the States or in Romania or in Africa or just in St. Vincent. We do it collectively together as a church body, as as a faith family, if you will. And today, what I want to do is be able to answer the question, maybe think this through a little bit. What is the goal of limitless faith? And here's what I would see in Scripture. I believe... And if maybe you're taking notes, write this down as it it is the title of the message. The goal of limitless faith, the goal of limitless faith is multiplication. The goal of limitless faith is multiplication. And, And you guys have lived that out through generations after generations after generations of such faithful gospel ministry here on the island. And by God's grace and mercy, it will continue for centuries to come. But listen, you really shouldn't care what Pastor AJ says. You should care what the Word of God says. Say, get in the Word on three. One, two, three. Fine. Okay. Don't ease up a little bit. Don't be too angry. Okay. Just kidding. Mark 6. Open up your Bibles to Mark 6. Mark 6, we're going to get in the Word. I'm going to give us three questions to consider out of maybe one of my favorite stories in the entire Bible. Three stories For us all to consider, what is your level of commitment to multiplication? Three questions that we can all ask ourselves to be able to to measure our commitment this morning to multiplication. Not your commitment to multiplication 10 years ago, or 5 years ago, or 1 year ago, or 6 months ago. Today, right now, 
March 12, 2023, what is your level of commitment to gospel-saturated multiplication that comes from a limitless God? And we are going to see this in the story in Mark 6, starting in verse 30. Mark 6, verse 30. Read these verses with me now. The apostles returned to Jesus and told him, sorry, sorry, I should have said that better. I'll read it out loud and you follow along in your notes. You guys have such an awesome accent. I'm going to be distracted by how awesome you sound when you're reading it. Yeah, man. How was that? How was that? All right. That was embarrassing for me. I'm sorry about that. Okay, here we go. Verse 30. Here we go. The apostles returned to Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. And he being Jesus said to them, come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest for a while. For many were coming and going and they had no leisure even to eat. Here's the first question I want you to ask yourself as we consider what is your level of commitment to multiplication. First question, am I following Jesus' example? Am I following Jesus' example? Example. Now, historical context for a second. Now, now we know theologically, we know who inspired this Bible and the book of Mark together, right? Who, who, who inspired this word that we just read? God. Absolutely. Now, we also know historically, we also know who wrote it down. Who wrote it down? Not your question. Mark, right? Very good. Very good. Now, now here, here's an interesting point. Do you know who, who actually spoke it? Here's who spoke it. Peter. Mark's job was to travel from place to place, wherever Peter was teaching, and he would transcribe what Peter was teaching on. He would write down, okay, what, Peter, what, what did Jesus do? What did Jesus say? And Mark, being inspired by the Holy Spirit, knew exactly what to include, what not to include in his gospel. Completely and totally inspired by God, written down by Mark, but spoken, and taught by Peter. Now, the question is, what did Peter know what to teach? Well, Peter knew how to teach because he heard Jesus teach. What we're going to see uh, leading up to this chapter is five times Jesus teaches specific things. And after this, in the book of Mark, multiple times after this, Jesus teaches some very specific things. Peter knew how to teach because he saw Jesus teach. Now, the other command that we see, look at the verbs that we see in 31. Come away by yourselves. And what are they supposed to do? They're supposed to rest. Where did they learn to go away by themselves? And where did the disciples learn how to rest? Where did they learn that from again? Jesus. And not just his words. Uh, uh, this is chapter six of the book of Mark. And in even by chapter six, Jesus three times has gone away by himself and rested in a desolate place. And he's going to do it five more times before the book's over. This is a pattern that Jesus developed to be able to teach us a little bit about Sabbath rest. Okay. Which to be frank, I'm looking forward to after these guys run hard. Okay. Pastor Al was like, hey, you want to come and teach? I was like, absolutely I do. And he's like, are you ready for that? I'm like, am I physically ready for that? But do you know who I am? I'm a physical <laughs> specimen from the States, baby. <laughs> and about a quarter of the way through the hike yesterday morning at 6.15, I was like, man, are we there yet? <laughs> you know what? Someone take a picture of that waterfall. Like I was, I was, I was ready for rest. But Jesus taught them in word and in deed that you've got to get alone by yourself and you've got to rest. Yeah. Now, see, this is a teaching the pattern, showing us the rhythm that whatever Jesus teaches and whatever Jesus wants, he's our example that we follow. And, and I know there's so many things as a high point family and as dear brothers and sisters in Christ, there are so many things that I know that we could agree on from theological points to methodological points in ministry to a heart and a desire to be able to see the island of St. Vincent come to know Christ that I've shared since I've been here the first time some almost 10 years ago, which is amazing for me to think of. Like I, 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 sh I share that. I have that with you. But if I had to wager, no, uh, no one... 
point of unity will be more than this point of unity. That we share together a deep desire that wherever Jesus leads us, we would go. Amen. Whatever Jesus tells us to go, that we would go. That whatever Jesus teaches, that we would learn. That whenever Jesus says serve, we would serve. That whenever Jesus says love, we would love. That whenever Jesus says give, we would give. And whenever Jesus says multiply, we would multiply. This is how we measure our commitment to multiplication. Are we really committed to following the example of Jesus Christ? Because if we are, we can't help but see multiplication all over the fingerprints of his ministry and of his earthly life. That's the first question. The first question, am I willing to follow Jesus' example? The second question, am I seeing Jesus stretch my sacrifice? Am I seeing Jesus stretch my sacrifice? And this is the heart of the story. This is the best part. I've been looking forward to preaching this story to you for over a month. Ready for it? Are you ready for it? Oh, okay. Okay, sorry. I thought you fell asleep for a second. Here we go. 33. Now many saw them going, and they recognized them, and they ran there on foot from all towns, and they got there ahead of them because they're not in the Caribbean. Do you, know, do you see how you can tell? The people were ahead of schedule to be at the worship service. No. <laughs> you like that? Little island time humor? It's okay. All right, we'll, we'll keep going. Sorry. Some of you are, some of you are like, ha, ha, ha. And some of you are like. All right. Sorry, I'll keep going. And when he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd, and he began to teach them many things. Don't you just love seeing the heart of Jesus there? He didn't teach them because he knew a lot and he wanted to share them a lot. Although that would have been true. Jesus started teaching because he had compassion for them. He loved them with a great sense of humility. He wanted to care for them. That's exact, that is such the heartbeat of this ministry that I notice here and see here. 35. So he's been teaching for a long period of time and then it started to grow late. And his disciples came to him and said, this is a desolate place, and the hour is now late. Jesus, send them away to be able to go into the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. Now, <laughs> I, uh, who do you think was the disciple that had the privilege of going to Jesus and going, Jesus, you're going a little long, right? Who do you think that was? It had to be Peter, right? I mean, like, Peter's always the guy. We called him earlier yesterday at another session. He is the disciple with a foot-shaped mouth. He keeps sticking his foot in his mouth. He keeps getting it wrong. Oops-a-daisy, oops-a-daisy. So he goes to Jesus. He goes, uh, Jesus, um, can you just land the plane? The people are getting hungry. It's getting kind of, man, it's getting kind of late. Now, I know you're the son of God and all, but can we just get it on? Can we wrap it up for a second? Right? And, and Jesus goes, oh, they're hungry. Okay, uh, 37. Um, they're hungry. You give them something to eat. Now, you give them something to eat. Now, um, at this point, we know that there are thousands of people there, correct? There are thousands of people listening to Jesus teach. Now, uh, your Bible likely says, um, it, does your Bible have the little header on it maybe? Those headers aren't inspired by, by God, but they're helpful, written by authors to be able to let us know what this topic is about. Does anyone have a header above this story? And what's it called? Jesus feeds the... Okay, good. That's almost right. 5,000 in this time in the first century. Culturally, um, th this would have fit in the practices. doesn't make it right, but it's how they operated. They would have counted family units instead of counting it, every individual there. Okay. So when it says 5,000 people, it doesn't mean 5,000 people. It means 5,000 blankets on the hillside with families on each blanket listening to Jesus teach. You understand what I'm saying? So it's a minimum of 5,000 people. And these disciples are going, Jesus, can, uh, they're getting hungry. Can we call a timeout so we can go to a mm, subway? Is that a thing? Um, do you guys have KFC here? Oh, oh, another thing we have unity on. Fantastic. Okay. 
can we call time out so we can get some chicken tenders up in here? Like, like they, they, need some, they need some food, some substance, right? And Jesus goes, no problem. You feed them. And Peter's like, but the disciples are like, oh, I, I would, but I, have, I haven't cashed the check yet. Uh, I don't have. Uh, are you crazy? Look what he says here. He keeps going. What, you want me to feed them? Do you have any idea how much that's going to cost? Shall we go? Look at, uh, it keeps going on in verse 37. Uh, Shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? Now, uh, 200 denarii, one denarii is a full day's wage. 200 denarii is over half a year of labor. So Jesus is like, no problem. They're hungry. You should pay for it and you feed them. And the disciples are like, you want me to pay half of my wage on sourdough bread for these people that are hungry? That's what you want, Jesus? Do you see the obstacle they've got here? Okay, so, so the plot thickens. What, what are they going to do here? What are they going to do? Verse 38, so Jesus says to them, well, how many loaves do you have? Now, uh, I'm not the smartest the smartest knife in the drawer. But if the people were hungry and they had food, I bet they would eat. What do you think? Right? But, but Jesus is like, well, well who, who's, who's got food out there? So they're like, uh, they're hungry. So then Jesus goes and tells them, okay, listen, go and see. Go and see. So... I saw one pastor uh, explain this illustration like this. I thought this would be fun for us, okay? Um, I'll be the disciples, and you be the people on the side of the mountain. Ready? Ready? Yeah. Thumbs up again. You ready? Okay, good, okay. Do you have any food? No. Do you have any food? No. Do you have any food? No. Oh, please don't tell me he's going to beat that pulpit again. Does he have, do you have any food? 4,999 times that over and over and over again until finally they go, do you have any food? And a kid goes, my mom always packs me a lunch. <laughs> like everywhere I go, right? So this boy brings how much? Five pieces of bread and two fish. Side note, do you think they were salt fish? Only if they were lucky, because I had that yesterday, and it, and it was good. Listen, <laughs> who here thinks that when Jesus heard that all the people were hungry, the thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people were hungry, who here thinks that Jesus Christ, being fully God and fully man, who here thinks that Jesus could have snapped his finger and everyone on that hillside could have been satisfied beyond their wildest expectations and dreams? Who thinks that could have been true? That's not what he did, though, is it? That's not what he did. He, he, he called his disciples to be obedient to him and to start believing by faith. Then he called the young boy to give measly as it was the offering that he had. That's exactly what Jesus does with us today, isn't it? Have you ever asked the question, why does God work that way? Man, of, of all the problems that we face in this world today, all the problems that that my church faces in Monmouth, Illinois. Could God solve all of those in the blink of an eye? You bet. And he chooses not to. He chooses to, to work through his people. Of all the problems that are in St. Vincent, all the issues that are here, could God, God solve all of them easily in his own strength and his own power? You bet he could, but he chooses not to. He chooses to work in and through his people. And the logical question that comes into my mind, maybe it comes into yours too, is, why would God operate that way? Why would God want, why would God call this young boy to give his sacrifice before he acts? 
Why would God call us to give a sacrifice at all? Let me give you three reasons why. If you're a note taker, write these down. Here's three reasons why God makes a sacrifice. Three reasons that God makes a sacrifice. Number one, because true worship, true worship costs us something. True worship costs us something. 2 Samuel 24, 24 um, shows us this principle. Maybe you remember the story. King David is getting ready to build an altar to be able to worship God. And he goes down. By this time, he's King David. He has dominion and authority over the city that he's in. He goes down to the local hardware store. Do you guys have a hardware store here in St. Vincent? What's, what's it called? Say it again. Ace. All right. I didn't mean to start a fight. I didn't mean to start a fight. Gibson or Ace. Okay. Of course, Junior's got a third. Okay. But, but so, so you go to one of these three. Just imagine David going there and he goes, listen, he, here's all the materials and all the hardware and all the things that I need to be able to build this altar. And the owner of the store goes, no, 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 no. You're the king. Your money's no good here. I can't charge you. You're the king. And David looks at the owner of the store and he says, listen to me. Don't give it to me for free. Because true worship to the living God, it costs us something. Okay? Now, now here's, here's the battle that you have. Here's the battle that you have in St. Vincent. Worship is so much more than the amazing ministry that we see on the stage Sunday morning from 9 o'clock to whenever your services end, 3 or 4 in the afternoon, whenever they end, right? <laughs> like, like whatever, don't tempt me because I will, okay? <laughs> like, like worship is so much more than, than the bounce of the feel of the bass. Do you understand that the, the reason that the Christian church has chosen to use music as the art form to express worship is because it allows us to not just do it individually, but corporately together. Worship isn't the art. Worship is the heart. That's the point of worship. So when we say things like, yes, I will. Yes, I will, God, give you glory. Even in the valley. The most important part isn't that we sing the right note in the right key at the bridge when the note hits. Praise God, because I'm like, like it's not good. It's not good, okay? But I'm passionate about it. I'm in the front row belting it out. And I can see Colin going like this, like, can you just stop? Like, it's a little off, bro. But the point isn't the art. The point is the heart. And God is always, always, always going after the worship of our heart. Do you, do you know when you can worship God? Every moment of every day with every decision that you make. And the gospel is consistently calling all of us brothers and sisters of St. Vincent to sacrifice everything we are. All of our dreams, all of our desires, all of our heart. To Jesus Christ as a spiritual act of worship. The first reason that God makes a sacrifice is because true worship costs us something. The second reason, and this isn't culminative, this isn't like a complete list. These are just three quick reasons that maybe will impact you today. The second reason that I can think of that God makes a sacrifice is before God wants to do something through you, God wants to do something in you. Before God wants to do something through you, God wants to do something in you. Think of the story that we see in Mark 6. The work that God did inside of this young boy is that in front of thousands upon thousands of people, they were asking for food. And I, I wonder if he gave it to him right away or did he hold it? Was he nervous? Did he? Or maybe he was a little entrepreneurial, like, the longer that they're looking for food and the hungrier they're getting, the more valuable that those fish sticks are getting, right? 
go on eBay and sell those bad boys for, for a quick buck, right? Uh, we, we don't know if he gave it to him right away or did he hang on to him for a second, but, but we do know at some point this boy goes in front of a mountain of people that are hungry and says, God, this is all I have, but I believe that you can use it. I believe that you can multiply it. That, that displays an amazing amount of faith the young boy has, doesn't it? See, God did something in that boy before God did something through that boy. The boy walked up to the disciples, handing this lunch over in faith. God worked in him, and then we'll see later, spoiler alert, if you've never heard the story, God's going to work through him in a miraculous way. And how does that apply to us today? Loved ones, God wants to work through you. He does. I firmly believe that God wants to transform the culture of St. Vincent in a miraculous way that glorifies himself through this church and like-minded churches that have their feet firmly planted on the word of God, their hands lifted up to their Savior, Jesus Christ, and their hearts surrendered to their Lord. I believe that. And I believe that by God's grace and by his mercy and by his favor, he has given you, High Point St. Vincent, a front seat to exactly what he wants to do through you. But don't miss this. Don't allow the ministry that God wants to do through you to become a distraction for what God wants to do individually in you first. May the the ministry that God wants flows through you, always be authentically coming from a place of, and God did this for me. And God did this for me. Because I'm here to tell you, devoted Christians that love the Lord have become so easily distracted at times of their life because the work that God wants to do through them became a distraction and idol of what God was actually doing in them. May it never be true of High Point St. Vincent. May it never be true of A.J. Reynolds. May it never be true of filling your name in the blank there. May we always be excited, not just what God wants to do through us, but what God is doing in us. Why does God want us to sacrifice? Because true worship costs us something. Because before God does something through us, he wants to do something in us. And third, the third reason that God wants us to sacrifice is to remind us that, watch this, watch this. Our things, our things are really his things. The things that we're sacrificing, the things that we're laying on the altar saying, God, here's my fill in the blank. It turns out those things really aren't first and foremost ours at all. They're actually God's first. You want to know where this plays out for me? Um, Sheldon, I don't know if you can pull that up in the back room. Uh, I, God has given me, maybe that picture of my family. God has given me, um, just because I, I haven't shown them off in this entire sermon. I've been holding off the temptation. Um, I have six girls. That's the correct response. That's the correct response. Please don't hold back you. Please, yeah, like, like they, and, and, and by the grace and mercy of God, they don't look like dad, they look like their mom. <laughs> like we could just pray right now in like close service because that's so, like we're so grateful for that, right? <laughs> there they are, okay? There they are. Now, this, I'm biased, this is a great family, okay? This is a great family. And, 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 and let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. Nowhere in my life do I have a greater opportunity to believe that these children are mine and not the Lord's. Because I love them. They're my kids. They're my kids. And God's going, you love them, 
and you're stewarding them. But they're my kids. And, 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 and I, thought, I thought I knew that until my oldest daughter just turned 16. And that's in the States when they get their license. And she gets in the car. And we did a whole bunch of driver's ed. Like, I don't know, you guys that do hours of driving. And, and oh, man, like, <laughs> like, it's a miracle we didn't get in an accident. It's pretty crazy. Um, but, you know, the, she, gets, she goes to get her license. She goes and gets her keys. She gone. And I thought I was ready to surrender her and release her to the Lord until I saw the brakes on the car, like the, like the, the rear brakes. And I'm like, whoa, 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 where are you going? You just going? And the Lord's been working on me, AJ, 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 AJ. Before she's yours, she's mine. And, 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 and I don't know what the thing is in your life that you might be tempted to hang on to a little bit too tightly. But loved one, this, this isn't a threat of power or control. This is actually the work of grace and mercy in your life from the living God. Ready for it? That thing that you're tempted to hang on to too tightly, before it's yours, it's his. And every time that God calls us to sacrifice and lay something on the altar, what does it do? It reminds us that we are not in control. It reminds us that our lives are not our own. It reminds us that we are merely stewards of every moment of every day that God calls us to give him glory through our sacrifice. Loved ones, High Point St. Vincent belongs to the Lord. His plans and purposes for this church belong to him. And what I'm so grateful for and what is so inspiring through the history of your church is how you and your leaders follow the calling and the spirit of the Lord and allow him to work in and through you in miraculous ways. Thank you for the way that you inspire me and my church and my leaders to do that. I just simply ask you continue to do it. Because it's a blessing to watch, even from a distance. I told you we would give three questions. We've given two so far. The first question to measure your commitment to multiplication. Am I following Jesus' example? Second question, am I seeing Jesus stretch my sacrifice? And the third question now, am I experiencing Jesus exceed my expectations? Am I experiencing Jesus exceed my expectations. Look at verses 43 and 44. This is the definition of exceeding expectations. Let's back up a little bit. 41. And he divided the two fish among them all. And they all ate. And they were, say that word. They were satisfied. They were satisfied. They were full. Last night, we had fried chicken with French fries and ketchup. And I ate and I ate, and I ate, and I ate, and then I went to bed, and I was, I was satisfied, okay? This is what the, this is what 5,000 plus, 5,000 minimum, pro, at least double, maybe even triple this number, all from a few fish and a couple of pieces of bread. But they weren't just satisfied, were they? 43. And they took up the 12 baskets full of broken pieces and of the fish. This is what's so awesome. When you read the stories about Jesus, don't you think that he was kind of sarcastic every once in a while? Like the, disi- like the disciples, he tells the disciples, like, go feed them. And they're like, you want me to spend half a year's salary and bread? No. Okay, well, go and see if they have food. You want me to go and see if they have food? Okay. You think it was like that? Angry walk-off? And they do the whole thing. Do you have food? No. Do you have food? No. Do you have food? No. And then one kid's like, oh, here's some food. And do you think at that point the disciples were, oh, praise God. (laughs) You got a Long John Silver snack pack. Now, Now we can feed everyone. This is amazing. 
Or do you think they were like, give me this. Oh, Jesus, here we go. <laughs> Don't worry, it's here. Here you go. You think it was like that? Maybe it was. Because Jesus' reaction isn't, hey, is everyone satisfied? Okay, we can call it off. Jesus' reaction is, hey, Peter, are they still eating? Everyone's full? Oh, we're almost done. And keeps pulling and pulling and pulling. And there's not just one leftover basket. And we're not talking basket. We're talking basket. Like big. Like, like feeding feeding a, a more than a family. Feeding like a neighbor. Every basket feeds multiple neighborhoods. And it's not just one or two or three. It's 12. Is Jesus making his point? Yes. Jesus is making a point here. Yes. O ye of little faith. You thought the people were going to be hungry? How does this apply to us today? Loved ones, I don't know the expectations you have for your life. But I do know that God's are better. And I don't know what expectations you have for your family. But I do know that God's are better. And I don't know what expectations you have for your professional life, for your vocation. But I know that God's are better. And I don't know what plans you have for this church. But I know that we can trust that God's are better. And here's why they're better. Because our plans and our dreams always limited. They're always limited. Which is exactly why I love that we're called to be a limitless church. The only way that we can be a limitless church is if we surrender ourselves to a limitless God. Otherwise, the dreams that we'll have, the visions that we'll have of ministry, the hopes and desires that we'll have will always be limited by our own thinking, our own strength, and our own ingenuity. Instead, may we surrender ourselves to a limitless God. Yeah. This morning on the way in, Pastor Al and I were just talking about how God worked in a miraculous way to start this church some, how many years ago, Pastor Al? Twelve years ago. That's unbelievable. And he was telling me a story of he was gathered with some church leaders of the church that I would later become a part of and was asked in that kind of American way around the boardroom, what's your vision for the ministry in the Caribbean for the next five years? Something like that, right? Do you know what, you know what answer your pastor gave? Do you know what answer he gave? Let I believe, firmly led by the Holy Spirit in this moment, your pastor said, I don't want to tell you a plan because I believe that would be putting limits on a limitless God. That's what Holy Spirit dependence looks like. May we never put limits on on a limitless God for what he wants to do in our lives or in our family or in our businesses or in our church. Because ultimately, our church is his church and he is limitless. Brothers and sisters, I can't tell you the privilege it is to be able to open up God's word um, for you this morning. Just know that you are deeply loved and will always have a cheering section in Monmouth, Illinois. <laughs>